Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we're a webinar, a webcast, online show, um, whatever the terminology is up for debate, um, but whatever you'd like to call us, we are here live on Wednesday mornings, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, both the live show and our archived recordings are both free and open to anyone to watch. So if you do see anything of interest to any of your colleagues, friends, neighbors, family, anybody out there, um, please do um, share our website to them and have them register for upcoming shows or watch any of our archives. And at the end of today's show, I will show you where all of that is. Uh, where the website is and where you can access the recordings. Um, we do a mixture of things here on um, the show, uh, book reviews, many tra training sessions, interviews, uh, demos of new products and services, um, basically anything library related. We That is our only criteria that whatever we have on the show is something that libraries are doing, something that they could be doing, some new resource or service available to them. Um, there's, um, you know, some of our topics you, you might look at a title and say, oh, libraries, but trust us, it'll always have something to do with libraries. That's what we are here do here at the Library Commission. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and do some sessions, um, some episodes for um, Nebraska-centric or specific things, but we also bring in guest speakers. And um, that's what we have this morning from um, the West Coast with us this morning is uh, Kristen Rebman, who's an associate professor at the School of Information at San Jose State University. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Good morning. Krista. And uh, with her also is Don Means, who's um, from the Gigabit Libraries Network. Um, Good morning, Don. Good morning, Krista. Morning. And uh, Kristen and Don have a presentation, as you can see from the slides here, about something new would be great for our small and rural libraries. We have lots of those here in Nebraska. Um, most of our libraries are that. We have a uh, you know, few large large libraries in Lincoln and Omaha and a few down the you know, middle corridor of the state, a little larger, but um, we are a very rural um, uh, state, as are many of the states in, in, in the country. And um, a new way to get some uh, internet access to your libraries using TV White Space. So I will just hand over to you guys to take it away and tell us about um, TV White Space. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Krista, for that warm welcome and for the opportunity to speak today and share our work uh, with TV White Space. Okay, so our presentation is really about uh, small and rural libraries and how they can lead with TV White Space, which is a new uh, wireless technology, and we'll be talking a lot more about what that technology is. So today we're going to do a little, just a brief introduction, uh, and Don is going to jump in and share a short video about TV White Space that was produced uh, as part of uh, his work uh, in the field. And we'll be providing some background uh, on TV white space technology and what it might mean for uh, the issues of access and inclusion in libraries, uh, particularly small and rural libraries. Then we'll be taking a trip to uh, Gigabit Libraries, uh, their resource hub, which has all different types of resources to understand whether TV white space would be appropriate for your context and how you might find out more in terms of how to implement or deploy the, the technology and equipment associated with it. And then finally, we'll be talking a little bit about our Beyond the Walls program, which is an IMLS funded project to support five TV white space uh, equipment deployments across the nation. So Don, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and have you show that, share that video with our viewers. Thank you. All right, hold on just a sec and I will make you a presenter, Don, so you can get that up on our screen for you. So you should see the pop-up to be to share your screen. We'll have to do that first. Excuse me, I have to, I had already Got to the full screen. All right. There we go. There we go. You see it? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do here is play a two-minute overview video to foreshorten the 
a typical kind of introduction and background on what we're talking about, the use of this new um, communications capability, its, its spectrum, <coughs> pardon me, uh, in the TV bands, uh, actually in the UHF portion of the TV bands that was uh, liberated or made available through the digital TV conversion and uh, part of that is now available for open shared use like Wi-Fi. Anybody can use Wi-Fi spectrum. They just buy equipment and then they communicate with it. So this is not a service. This is a networking capability that would extend a library's network. And you can see from this video how we think that could be done and, and valuable. So I'll just play that now. Mm -hmm. that sound? Um, it looks like you've got it muted on the YouTube there. You need to click on the sound just to come over to the right. On YouTube itself, it looks like you've got it muted. All right. Just right. Um, on YouTube, there we go. Yeah, there we go. In fact, some 80 million rely in part or entirely on public libraries for broadband internet access. In two-thirds of U.S. towns, libraries are the only source of no-fee internet access. But now, we're going beyond library walls. That's right, library Wi-Fi can support new hotspots in key locations in your community, thanks to the power of TV white spaces. Wait, what are TV white spaces? Well, years ago, TV broadcasts used analog signals, which were large and spaced far apart. Now, with the switch to digital, TV signals are much more compact and closer together. The unused space that remains in between these channels? That's TV white spaces. They can power Wi-Fi networks with supercharged signals that deliver broadband miles away, passing through obstructions like buildings, trees, and even over small hills. Hotspots can be fixed at locations like public book kiosks, parks, playgrounds, and even public buildings. And they're easy to move, too. Movable TV white space hotspots can turn occasional fairs and markets into free public Wi-Fi zones. As one example, in Manhattan, Kansas, the hotspot goes between the community swimming pool and the ice rink as the seasons change. And if disaster strikes, these remote communications units can be redeployed to quickly assist rescue and recovery. You can increase your community's emergency preparedness by installing units at other community anchors, schools or clinics, for example, creating a backup communications resource that's vital for disaster relief. As a traditional source of public information, libraries are ideal as community labs to pilot this technology and are poised to unlock the revolutionary potential of TV white spaces and Wi-Fi together. There, that wasn't so painful. No, that was awesome. That was very clear. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is our primary uh, website for the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, which is a, an open consortium, a uh, global consortium of libraries, uh, ten technology, innovated, innovating libraries uh, around the world that are looking to do interesting things with technology and then TV white space has emerged as uh, a, a project over the last three years. We've been uh, working on this since it first became available. Uh, it's been in, in development for some 12 years since they had this idea, even before the iPhone came out and, and the surge in demand for wireless uh, data communications capability has exploded. Uh, so it's been a long time coming, but it's a very special thing. Uh, you wanted me to talk about the, the resource hub. Before I we think get... that we had a couple of slides before the resource oh, hub okay. that I can go ahead and switch to, and then that'll sort of lay the groundwork for you to go through all of those resources. Okay, all right. It's, very, it's sure. actually pretty short. All right, I'll change back to you now, Kristen, no problem. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so... There you go. Let me jump back into my uh, 
make sure I didn't go too far. Okay, so as that video mentioned, uh, there are, you know, there's everyday uses for the radio fre uh, frequency spectrum, and these portions of the spectrum are reserved for public use, and white, TV white space is just one segment of that that can be used by libraries to expand their Wi-Fi networks. So what, what do we mean by TV white space? We, me, we mean those unused frequencies in the TV band of the frequency spectrum as, I, as the video and uh, this slide here mentioned. And so it allows us to expand uh, physical access to library digital services by taking that broadband connection and connecting it to several uh, remote hotspots that can be placed in the community. And so a library uh, community network would be expanded beyond the walls of the library to reach whatever places that the library can imagine. And so this would be great for a rural library. Uh, as this slide shows, you could have a rural or small library with a TV white space base station connected to an internet access point. Okay, so you'd have your broadband coming into the library. And then there would be an antenna attached to the, or mounted on the, basically the roof of the library that would allow you to broadcast to remote, remote radios using TV white space frequencies. So they're going to use those uh, frequencies uh, of the spectrum, those TV white space frequencies, to communicate with the remote client radios. And so you can see in the top right hand corner of this line and this infographic really is the anatomy of a TV white space hot hotspot, which uh, is it works. You have remote client radios which will extend uh, Wi-Fi into the community, and they'll be connected to a Wi-Fi router. So the hotspot itself connects patrons to the internet by a laptop, tablet, or mobile device, just like any Wi-Fi hotspot would. That would be within the walls of the library, but now you can expand that connection to other places in the community. And so we, when we created this infographic, we had in mind that a library might want to create a hotspot in a senior center, or a clinic, or a shelter, or maybe a museum, a park, or some other type of uh, portable event that might be moving through the community, or a temporary event like a, a farmer's market, or a fair, or perhaps a school, like in, in community and uh, collaborations among schools and libraries are uh, really fantastic examples and of uh, the types of collaborations that can happen uh, among different community-based organizations. And so the, the uh, distance away from the original uh, broadband coming into the library may vary, but uh, Hotspots conceivably, the technology could be pushed to six plus miles, uh, but again, it's going to be really idiosyncratic to the context that you're working in, the geography, and uh, your initial connection coming in, so there's a lot of factors in play. Okay, so as I mentioned in this previous slide, uh, Wi-Fi plus TV white space allows for the extension of Wi-Fi networks into the community. Uh, after deploying TV white space technology, uh, you no longer have any, you don't have to worry about wiring up another uh, Wi-Fi network in a community uh, uh, center or a shelter. You can do that in a wireless fashion. Uh, you don't have to have a carrier once you have the initial investment of the equipment. You don't need a carrier to interact with in terms of monthly fees. Uh, I know that hotspots, like checkout hotspots, are getting really popular in a lot of libraries, and a lot of them are CDMA-based or basically like cell phone types of hotspots where there's a monthly fee. And so after the initial investment in this equipment, you don't have any monthly fees. So that's really an advantage. Uh, to small libraries in particular in terms of like not having funding to support an ongoing program like that. And so just uh, to focus on this issue of small and rural libraries and why TV white space is so important to them, it, you know, with a lot of uh, technologies and the adoption path of new technologies, uh, urban and developed areas are advantaged. But in this, in the case of TV white space, small and rural libraries really do have an advantage 
uh, with TV wide space and the deployment of related networks. And the reasons for this are that in rural libraries, there are, there's lots of availability on the spectrum. And Don, when he goes to the resource hub and he shows you that wealth, uh, the wealth of resources there, he'll show you how a, a rural area has an advantage over an urban area in terms of access to channels. And in an ongoing fashion, there will be less competition for channels because you have less uh, competitors seeking those channels for other uses and other uh, perhaps uh, forms of media to be uh, broadcast over those frequencies. Now there are some challenges with uh, TV white space and we'll be talking about those uh, a little bit later. Uh, one key one, one key challenge is that it requires a minimum connection rate of 20 plus megabits per second. So you kind of you have to have a somewhat robust connection uh, coming into the library uh, before you get started with TV white space. And I think that these sort of advantages and challenges are a good lead in to uh, have Don uh, talk more about uh, the Gigabit uh, Libraries Resource Hub. Okay, great, my cue. Thank you. Uh, excellent, Kristen. Uh, uh, these these bullets are uh, are highlights for consideration uh, and the kind of acknowledgement here that the the video mentioned the the number of 80 million uh, people uh, relying entirely or, or or partially on libraries for internet access. This was this was a peak number, I think, uh, in the in the few years after the financial crisis, it has gone down now. Uh, maybe half that number now uh, rely on libraries to that extent. But it, it, it makes the point in times of stress and need, uh, libraries come to the fore as places people turn to for help and, and resources. So um, it's still tens of millions uh, do rely on the library. and. Um, and so, well, they all have to go to one of the actual facilities, one of the 16,000 something facilities to act, access that service. So our point here is uh, why not make that more convenient, uh, at least somewhat more convenient, so that there are other places where library Wi-Fi, not just kind of general open internet, but access to the library, uh, digital services, as Kristen said, one of which, and maybe the most popular, which is internet access, but it's not the only one. You know, there's library databases, there are librarians, and other things that uh, that the, lab the library may want to offer to to patrons. Uh, we recommend uh, some kind of a, a splash page or a uh, a web page where uh, people accessing uh, the library Wi-Fi in a remote place would uh, be welcome and made understood what is they're being offered and the different choices. Other other city or county services would be another another path that libraries could offer uh, people. We also are uh, uh, encouraging libraries to put up physical signage in these places. So you're, uh, let's say in a park, for example, put a sign up saying you're now in a library uh, service zone. And, and just to be clear on that, that that area of access is the range of a traditional Wi-Fi router, you know, 50, 100 feet, something like that. Uh, what white space does is uh, provide the, the, the backhaul or the distance link to the hub, as the graphic here shows, where the internet connection comes into the library and then is, it is uh, distributed uh, wirelessly using the TV white space equipment. And then you see at the top there, the client radio, uh, the blue box, uh, a regular Wi-Fi router is plugged into that. And that's what creates the interface, the universal interface that everybody uh, uses to connect to uh, the, the internet or to a network. Uh, so it's those two together that, that make this work. And then the uh, other point, the other important point about the, the, the capability of the backhaul and the availability of channels uh, Kristen made the point, but I think it 
uh, bears re-emphasizing is that this is a really special circumstance where, at least in our view, this may be the first time ever that rural America has caught a break on the economics of an infrastructure. It's always been, I mean, electricity and telephone and water, all of it has been more expensive uh, and difficult to deploy because the distances are greater, there are fewer people served, and they generally have less, less money. And so this has always been a handicap. That was the reason that universal service was conceived, uh, whether it was the rural electrification or, you know, as I said, telephone service. The whole idea is that once something is considered a basic service, then it is deemed uh, uh, a, a national priority that everyone should have affordable access to that as a basic service. And uh, but with the arrival of broadband, we lost track of that. And so the providers have been able to prioritize markets. Uh, we didn't used to think of ourselves as markets for these kinds of services, but, but we now are, and these are increasingly, uh, these what used to be considered utilities are increasingly understood and behave as, as private uh, companies able to pick and choose where they invest in upgrades uh, to their infrastructure. So in this case, because the, the spectrum represents the areas where broadcasters, TV and radio broadcasters, uh, operate, the more rural, the fewer broadcasters there are, and the more available spectrum there is to use. So there's, there's little or none of this available in the metropolitan, the big metropolitan areas like uh, New York, where I am in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, and so forth. But almost everywhere else is some or a lot, and the more rural, the more of this is available. The caveat is the flip side, and that is a lot of libraries in, in more remote areas, small rural libraries, have less uh, uh, backhaul or, or internet connections to their facilities, uh, which they need to allocate some of that uh, to support these wireless connections, which of course are two-way. And so uh, our baseline assumption here is that it's national policy under the, the, the National Broadband Plan, uh, under the, uh, the FCC's Universal Service Fund, that, that libraries and schools are uh, in, the, in the broad national plan, you know, all community anchor institutions shall have gigabit fiber. And the, the changes, recent changes in the E-rate are built to help that happen. The, the additional million and a half dollars a year, raising that fund to nearly four billion dollars a year to, to deliver fiber to schools and libraries. Libraries, as I'm sure you're all aware, disproportionately uh, uh, participate in that due to a number of factors. They're, you know, they're smaller, they're less capable of dealing with the, uh, the paperwork involved, and then uh, filtering is also an issue with a lot of libraries. So uh, even as there are eight times more, as many school facilities as libraries, uh, libraries get much less than one-eighth of the total pool of money but they should be more active in pursuing those. And we also recommend, as we're seeing in many states, and I can't speak for Nebraska, but I, I, I hope so, uh, that libraries are aggregating their, their application process under E-rate so that they can uh, take advantage of these funds. There's also additional funds for in-house Wi-Fi, expanding that, because you know a connection to the building doesn't really help anybody. Uh, it has to be delivered to individuals in the form they can use, either the workstations that are in the in the library or, or wi increasingly as Wi-Fi as people bring in their own devices. And as these devices get uh, less and less expensive, they're more and more popular for people to bring in. Uh, and I'm sure all of you have the experience of uh, patrons uh, sitting in the parking lot after hours accessing the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, which is generally left on in most places. Uh, that that's evidence of demand to uh, 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 try to install new library hotspots in other convenient places. So this is how you uh, uh, let me see if I have control here. Uh, uh, this is how you determine if you uh, are eligible to do this. The, these two uh, 
uh, basic requirements of uh, uh, backhaul, at least 20 megabits, better, I mean more is better here, uh, and then also spectrum availability. So we'll just demo this very quickly. If I right. um, Don, if you want to, this is, Kristen's still showing her screen, but I can switch to you so you can live oh, demo this. All right, thank you. Yeah, hold on just a second. We'll get yours up. So go ahead and do the share your screen again. All right, thank you. There you are, you're on. Okay, so this is a, this is a checklist uh, for uh, participation in the Beyond the Walls. We'll get to that, the IMLS uh, grant that uh, Kristen mentioned. But it's a general checklist for any library or any facility, really, uh, that would be interested in deploying this. Uh, there's a, another two-minute video that kind of runs through this list. Uh, we'll just touch on it manually here. And the first one, as I mentioned, is this necessary backhaul, at least 20 megabits. And then you have to check for uh, channels, and I'll demo that here. So we need a, since we're talking about Nebraska, uh, someone give me a, a town in Nebraska, a name of a town. Um, let's go with Sydney. Let's try Sydney. I know yes. um, someone from there is on. S I D S Y D S I D N E Y E Y. <laughs> okay, so this is a this is a database of uh, of available channels, and you can see the whole country. Uh, the dark areas there's little or none. The yellow and even orange, and especially the green areas, you can see at the top they have tons of it. And so this below uh, is one is the result there. And so what we're really interested in here are the are the UHF channels, which are 14 and above. And so you can see there's lots and lots of available spectrum for Sydney to use to serve its community. So that's the big bonus news: is you've got a lot of stuff. And as Kristen mentioned in her slides. This is, uh, this is internal networking, so there are no carriers involved. I mean, you're paying someone to, to connect you, uh, the facility, but this is, this is uh, a way to leverage that connection and expand, it, expand its availability around the community without any, uh, there, there are also no need for towers, uh, much less third parties or service fees ongoing. The, the one point about, uh, the popularity of the checkout hotspot that, that I think Bear is mentioning is this this is not mobile technology. Uh, cell systems are rated for mobile. You know, driving down the road, your your device, your phone, uh, is handing off signals from one tower to the next. There's a large network, even though it has a lot of gaps in it, there's a substantial network of towers. Uh, that uh, connect to these devices and they're built very sophisticated uh, that they can hand off from one to the next and you, you don't even realize you're, you're moving your connection from one tower to another. In the case of TV white space, this is not mobile technology. These remote units are portable. They can move, be moved from place to place, but they, they're really uh, uh, built for, to be fixed, you know, movable or they say nomadic fixed. So you can move it around but setting it up is, uh, uh, is there's a little more to it. Uh, you know, they, they, need to, they need to be tuned a little bit. And so I don't think these are yet uh, uh, to be understood as replacement devices for these uh, MiFi units, which are, you know, really interesting, cool if you can, if you can support them. This could be seen as a complement where these are located in, in uh, publicly accessible places, what is what we would... Uh, suggest rather than uh, for patron use at home. Not, I'm not there yet. Um, the, uh, the coverage map uh, is another kind of analysis tool. I'll do this real quick. I don't want to take too much time here. But this is a map of the, uh, uh, the IMLS uh, database of some 17,000 library coordinates. And all those little red dots there represent libraries. They actually represent uh, 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 two kilometer uh, radius around the library, which you can s uh, search by state. Back to Nebraska here. 
So those are all the libraries in Nebraska, and each one is surrounded by a, uh, uh, a two-kilometer uh, uh, zone. So let's just have a look at Arcadia here. And so this is, this is a tool designed to help you uh, kind of plan where in your town remote locations might be sited. So it looks like there's a park here by the river and you know there's probably other places around that, that might uh, benefit from that. And that's just at two kilometers. We give these two these different radius here uh, to uh, uh, the, the signals don't look they're, they're not perfect circles like this. You know they're they look more like Doppler radar. They're the the special quality about uh, TV white space and, and the reason that TV uh, broadcasts use these uh, uh, frequencies in the first place is that they have this long range and penetrating capability. So they they have the capability to pass through obstructions, which is a, a special characteristic since most wireless requires line of sight. And when you see those microwave dishes around each other, they're pointed at other antennas, other microwave. Uh, antennas that can see each other and if they can do that that's called line of sight then they can do and they're not too far apart they can do very fast communications and if you have that kind of an opportunity you would probably want to research uh, using uh, microwave instead of TV white space but where you have non line of sight capability some instructions then this is what uh, would be uh, something to absolutely consider so, so that's uh, so you you know these are just kind of steps that you go through to determine uh, where you might want to uh, set up remote uh, uh, stations. Uh, Kristen uh, has created uh, an extraordinarily uh, thorough and informative and helpful uh, self-paced course to uh, you know go through this. We're running through these highlights right now, but. Uh, 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 that this course is, is built uh, to take everyone more deeply into the things we're highlighting today and have you, you know, to the point where you could do, uh, create a plan and, and, uh, uh, and then do uh, what's called a paper evaluation. Once you've set your, your uh, locations for your, uh, for your equipment, uh, you're at that point you'd want to consult with uh, vendors and these are the three vendors these are the three leading vendors of the world of this equipment they're small companies uh, but this is a this is, this is a very new uh, thing though it is being explored and adopted at various stages around the world as uh, digital TV conversion is a global phenomena and so uh, what these vendors would do would be uh, 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 what we call, they call a paper analysis. So if you give them the coordinates, let's say, for your base station and, and three remote locations, they can uh, use Google Earth and get a, a side view. They can see all the intervening buildings and trees and terrain between any two points and estimate the likelihood of a successful connection. So you go through this, you know, they, they validate and verify your plan, and then they give you, you know, a price quote on, on what a system would cost, and then you make your decision about acquiring it the way any, you decide to uh, acquire any kind of equipment or service. Uh, though this is equipment and not a service, to, except to the extent that you're getting service from the manufacturers. So uh, that's the normal kind of process that people take uh, to evaluate and decide if this is something for them. Uh, the equipment costs are comparatively low, really very low compared to uh, telecom infrastructure costs because you just attach some of this, this equipment, the radios and their antennas, to poles or sides of the building uh, to set up the links. And so the, without wires or digging or any permissions or permits, uh, it's really very low cost. The equipment itself for a simple network uh, should be in the range of oh, uh, six, eight thousand dollars for a base station and, and uh, 
two or three remotes. It, it varies by configuration and by vendor, but uh, let's say 10,000 uh, for the equipment you know, would be a, a, a network that would probably accommodate most libraries uh, due to the, to, the, to the backhaul, the amount of spectrum that would need to be allocated to, uh, uh, for sharing in the wireless network, and, uh, and also a, 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 a very good kind of first stage. You, you want to learn how this, how this equipment performs in your area. That's the most important information, and you can only really know that by doing it. So you uh, want to make a, a, a good evaluation and then you want to make a careful kind of risk assessment on, on what's, uh, what are the downsides, what are the potential upsides. Uh, but we think this is a real, a real winner, especially for rural libraries and rural uh, communities in general. So I think we had uh, your other slide or, or the next item on the agenda, Kristen. Do you want to take that back or do you want me to show something else here? I think that for the after the resource hub, we were going to talk a little bit about the. Uh, I was just going to show them the the course, and you could probably just click on that yourself. We okay. can just let the participants see what that looks like. And yeah. so basically, you can just click on that at the go to the canvas.net, uh, which is Canvas Network uh, for all of their online open courses, and you can search for. If you get to just their website and have to search for the course, you can just search for TV White Space and our course will come up and you can enroll. The course, uh, it will be continue to be available until May 1st. So if you haven't had a chance to check out the resources there, like Don said, that we have uh, activities in the course that are uh, related to thinking about your own uh, possible setup and your own planning with TV White Space. So, uh, the content itself, uh, some of it is just background information where you can get a little bit deeper with that and then some of it is really about shepherding you through the process of thinking about your own plan which I think is uh, fun and it's really uh, geared toward uh, you thinking about what you in your library would want to do. Okay, so that's the course, and then I think we're going to talk a little bit about the Beyond the Walls program, which is the IMLS project. I just, I just project. wanted to jump in a sec here, Kristen, to let people know that this is, um, I can see the dates on there, it says that it started February, going back to the course, February 6th, but this is a self-paced course, correct? So yes, it's completely It's okay that you, you didn't have to start on February 6th, that you can do it at your own speed any time between now and May 1st. Right, right. And the modules themselves, uh, if anyone has interest, we could look at that you know, during the, the Q&A session if there, anyone has interest in looking at what the modules look like. Uh, there are five modules with the course, and each one of them doesn't take but uh, maybe an maybe an hour for, per module. So if you haven't gotten started, you haven't had a chance to jump in, don't feel like it's too late. You're not going to need 12 weeks to finish the course. Right. Uh, the time commitment is really, really manageable to See, work your way through. it just an hour per week, so you can yeah. definitely catch up on this, no problem. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> good, good point about the self-paced nature of the course. So at your own uh, time and convenience, and, and you can start any time. Uh, so to the to the program, I want to just touch on this so we can open it up for questions here uh, and stay within our hour. But uh, the Beyond the Walls awards uh, result from a, a grant that uh, San Jose State and Gigabit Libraries uh, won last year to build that course that uh, Kristen has accomplished and also to offer uh, grants. Uh, $15,000 subawards is the correct usage there uh, to uh, libraries who have created proposals uh, uh, for innovative use of TV white space in collaboration with other community partners like schools or clinics or public safety agencies or museums or anybody. Uh, where uh, they would jointly look at how uh, this technology could support uh, their their daily activities, their their ongoing missions, as well as be uh, available in reserve as a, as a backup uh, capability 
in the event of any kind of a disaster or really any kind of a lights out scenario uh, where communication uh, could be interrupted. We're seeing even more evidence that the, about the possibility of the internet actually going down uh, for periods of time. Uh, not many of us think about what life would actually be uh, like without that, uh, but it would be a, a remarkable change. In any case, uh, I, I regret that uh, the, the, the deadline for these proposals is Monday, which is not much time if you haven't already uh, become aware of this, but if you, if you do, uh, if you are interested and you can put a uh, proposal together uh, by Monday, uh, midnight, Hawaii time, we're giving every minute possible to, to the motivated people that want to jump in on this, then uh, we, will, we will give it a look and if it has some promise we will uh, uh, come back and, and help you develop it a little further before we do the final evaluations on these, on these proposals. So uh, it's a kind of a mixed message here of maybe be a little bit discouraged because it's late, but don't be totally discouraged because the window is still open if you're motivated enough to uh, jump in. And then there's all these other items explained, and here's the application form where you talk about what you want to do in, you know, in 500 words and what the need is in a couple hundred words. So it's, it's not very complicated, but we, we uh, 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 judge these uh, uh, according to their creativity, the level of uh, collaboration involved, and also the expressions of commitment by the, by the library and, the, and their partners in doing this. So uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of really interesting proposals come in and uh, uh, some great ideas. Uh, I do know that uh, we're, there are a couple that are coming in from Nebraska already, um, and it looks like the, pop, the most popular collaboration is, is partnering with schools. And I'll just I'll turn it over to Kristen after uh, uh, make this point that uh, what from what we've learned is that the schools in Nebraska are highly wired. You know they all have high capacity fiber. At, at least it seems like they they all or nearly all do through through Network Nebraska. And right. yes. by comparison, the libraries have uh, much much slower connections for some of the reasons we touched on above. And yet, those libraries have to support or are expected to support the students uh, who leave these school environments, these well-connected school environments, to do homework after hours. So how can a school and library uh, team up to increase the capability at the library using TV white space? In the short term, it might look like uh, a base station is actually located at the school building and the remote unit at the library, where they might be able to add you know, another 10 megabits to a library who may only have, you know, an old T1 line, a 1.5 megabit connection. So that's a very interesting scenario and something that can be done, you know, now, today. There's nothing that, you know, th that would stop anybody from moving on a project and having it set up, you know, within, within a few weeks even. Uh, so I say nothing, it, you know, there's, there's, uh, there are issues involved naturally, but I'm saying there's no, there are no regulatory or permission hurdles or any of that. If, if you've got the will and a few thousand dollars, uh, then that kind of a, a project is possible. So with that, uh, Kristen, if you have other items on the agenda or you want to open up to questions, I think I've done enough. <laughs> Thanks, Don. That was fantastic. If, if you go ahead and switch back to my desktop, I'll just go ahead and close out the presentation and open it up for questions. Sure. There you go. Go ahead and open my slides back up. Uh, just as Don mentioned, we have that Libraries White Space project that we're uh, still accepting applications for. And we just want to say thank you, and again, for the warm welcome, Kristen, for allowing us to come present. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to be able to reach people, especially via the online space uh, and these webinars. Uh, so we just really want to encourage anyone to contact us. We love to talk about TV White Space and all of these activities that we're involved in. So drop us an email, connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, however you feel comfortable. We'd love to be in contact with everyone. So thanks again. 
Great. So, questions, anybody out there? Yes, we did have some questions that came in uh, while you guys were talking. And um, we'll just start at the, uh, right at the top of the ones we have here. Um, Actually, um, one of our libraries who did apply, Sydney, who I mentioned um, earlier, um, Sydney Public Library, I did not know they had sent an application, but I knew that their director, uh, Andrew Sherman, was on the line and asking some questions. Um, but he did say that they have actually submitted an app for Sydney. Uh, but he wanted to know, um, is there any risk that these frequencies at some point could get designated for a specific service by the feds? Like, could they potentially be no longer... Well, this is true of all spectrum, all spectrum. Uh, you know, all spectrum starts out as the public airwaves, and then over time, it's allocated to uh, mostly for uh, commercial use. And so, these take the form of licenses for specific frequencies to carriers to use to build into their systems and then resell uh, services through. Large chunks of spectrum are held by the Defense Department. Uh, and then other government agencies are holding these. It's the, it's the responsibility of the FCC to manage all of this, and their obligation is to optimize uh, the use of spectrum. So this is a kind of a general term, but what it usually, what it tends to mean is that uh, if spectrum goes unused, either a licensee acquires it but doesn't use it, or no one actually asks for it, then the FCC is obligated to try to find other ways to use it. Hmm. So this particular spectrum is highly desirable, generally speaking, because of its, uh, its characteristics that we talked about. Uh, they call this beachfront spectrum because of its, uh, its uh, penetrating capabilities. So in certain places, uh, it's tremendously valuable. It's a strange phenomenon when you, when you consider a, a single channel uh, uh, might be worth a billion dollars in Manhattan, uh, New York, and in parts of Nebraska you couldn't give it away for free because the carrier that to use it would have to build towers out there and, and they would consider that even just a tower too expensive uh, to serve it. So uh, the, I guess the risk would be where uh, the technology was not used. Uh, by uh, who we think are ideal users, the public services uh, sector, uh, to use this this public domain uh, spectrum, which is uh, shared, by the way. You know, like Wi-Fi, we share those frequencies when we connect via Wi-Fi with other Wi-Fi. That's why they right. uh, they don't work so well sometimes. But I would mm -hmm. say this is a, a extremely low probability, especially especially in areas where there's a big abundance of the spectrum, like in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. But if um, we don't use question, it, yeah. Yeah. We use it before, yeah, while well, it's yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and actually, we have the next question actually relates to what you're talking about, about Wi-Fi, you know, uh, strength up and down. Um, someone says, sometimes our TV channel reception is good and sometimes the signal is too weak. Would this be true for the wireless accessibility using the TV white space? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, variability of TV signal strength. I think the, the, the transmit, the broadcast signals, which uh, for, for TV and radio broadcasts are measured in thousands or even hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of watts, these radios are low power, you know, like 5 and 10 watts, which is kind of phenomenal that, that such a low power uh, transmitter receiver uh, can do data communications over miles, but they do. Uh, they have the advantage of their penetrability makes them less uh, disrupted by uh, rain or even snow, which is disrupts most other kinds of wireless data communications. So mm -hmm. I can't say that that they perform uh, at a at a totally constant rate all the time, but I haven't heard that they that they experience a lot of variability. Uh, uh, due to conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. Once they're set up, you have a measure of the signal strength, and that more or less is what you get, uh, at least as far as I understand it. It might be a good question to put to a vendor, though. Right, they might know if they've what experience or, and I saw you did have on your website links to um, information about the Kansas project, so maybe see what else 
That was a setup. That's a good. That's a good resource. Uh, the Manhattan, Kansas, <laughs> uh, was an early uh, an early user uh, highlighted in the, in the video. Uh, they also uh, deployed one in the senior center, which has been a big success, and another one in the park, also a success. Uh, and we just learned the other day that they were looking to go kind of a next stage project and build out white space. But the city informed them that because of the success of these uh, remotes, that the city has decided to build fiber uh, connections to these same places uh, because the demand has been proven through the use oh. of white so Start out with the TV real. white space, show the, show the demand and that, that it's actually being used, and then that convinces the city to invest in the fiber. Interesting. Precisely. Yeah. So, yeah, wireless pulls fiber. Users demand uh, just what you said, perfectly expressed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, uh, another question. What about equipment maintenance? Maintenance once you get the the tower and the um. Uh, no towers. Maintenance. No towers. Uh, just a pole. Well, the, so, right. Uh, a, a base pole, station. And the, yeah. A pole. You would mount the the base station antenna on a pole, and then the pole would be clamped onto. Uh, typically the side of a building or maybe on top of a building and then uh, and then the remote antennas uh, if you could remember that diagram are kind of look like old TV rooftop antennas though there are some new ones that are much smaller they look like a your regular Wi-Fi router though their range is not going to be as far the uh, because the you know the antennas are smaller and indoor uh, but the outdoor ones have a kind of a lateral spar that aims back at the base station to optimize the uh, the link. Uh, the uh, the maintenance issues seem to be very very low. Uh, you know, there's a setup where there's the attachment, the installation uh, of the units, and then the tuning of the radios to optimize the the signal strength. But then at that point, they were pretty, they're you know pretty much static devices, not unlike a regular Wi-Fi uh, hotspot. The vendors are available uh, by phone and through the internet uh, for for installation and support. Uh, the uh, the the base station can be uh, monitored directly through the internet from the vendor's location. They can see what it's doing and how it's performing, and can offer additional support. Uh, you may, depending on the kind of you know uh, local support you have, you may want to engage the services of a local. Uh, you know, uh, wireless ISP or uh, someone with experience in in uh, radios to come and, and help you get it set up, or uh, even look at it if if it's experiencing some difficulties. But our, all the stories we're getting is that these are very stable systems once they're set up. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, they don't need much uh, backup or support once they're there. They're pretty much there. And having those companies of being available for for help afterwards, that they do, I guess you know, uh, keep up with their installations. Sure, it's yeah. early. You know, this is all pretty early in the market, so all right. all the all the installations are important because they're all kind of stories that stand out, and so everybody mm -hmm. kind of rises and falls on on uh, the experience and the and the stories from the from these uh, installations. Okay, um, we did just have a comment too. Um, actually, um, Tom um, Rolf is here from the uh, CIO's office here in Nebraska, who I know you guys, I believe, have met with or spoken with. Um, so that was excellent observation that you had about Nebraska schools and libraries working together um, with the Nebraska Nebraska Link and and all of that. He's, in, he's hey, Tom. In, yeah. <laughs> um, and yes, we have one uh, last. Just to, just to follow up on that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think. There is uh, an opportunity. It's pretty clear in Nebraska, just kind of the size, the the structure, the the, the rural nature, and the institutions in Nebraska. Uh, Tom's office, the office of CIO, the the state commission, uh, all represent, at least from our perspective, uh, an opportunity for a, a, a strong statewide collaboration uh, to uh, explore this stuff exhaustively, uh, mm -hmm. and. Through you know mutual support, uh, find uh, you know better opportunities. So I, I yeah. definitely encourage that. 
And we always have new libraries um, joining into the connection with the schools here in Nebraska. So that's definitely something for our um, lots of lots of different options out there for our libraries. But that's one that I know some are um, jumping on because it is such a good connection. That, as you said, that they already have set up for the schools, and the libraries can now partner with them and join in and get access to that good internet connection. And it's been successful so far. Great. Um, if anybody has, we're getting almost to 11 o'clock, I just want to remind people if you do have any other questions, do type them into the questions section and we'll grab them. Um, one last question, which um, I know I can answer um, and you guys may know as well, is about E-rate. Uh, can you discuss how libraries would be able to use internet funded by E-rate? Um, is this an issue to use outside the building? Um, I am actually the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries here in Nebraska, so I do handle it. And um, TV White Space is actually not E-rate eligible. Um, and it has to do with exactly what you mentioned in your question, being outside of the, um, sending the internet outside the building. E-rate does still have the restriction that it must be used in the eligible location, in the school and in the library. Um, the fact that, you know, sometimes your Wi-Fi does go outside the walls, and Don, you mentioned people sitting in your parking lot <laughs> accessing it, that's okay, but this is something specifically for the purpose of extending the internet beyond the library um, that does not meet the E-rate requirement. Uh, they did do a pilot project back in 2011-12 with um, lending out hotspots, um, library hotspots, um, internet hotspots. Um, the FCC did to see how that would work, um, but they did not then use that information to add it to the E-rate eligible services and say, okay, yes, you can provide um, internet beyond the walls of the school or library. So at the moment, TV white space would not, any if you are getting your internet and then sending it out using this, you cannot get E-rate on that internet anymore because you'd be you know, providing it outside of the library's walls. So any of the costs for um, get, you know, putting up the antennas and everything and all that equipment is um, not E-rate um, eligible because of where it's getting uh, sent out, yeah. Krista, may I, may I uh, add to that or even take a slight exception to it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, TV white space has zero cost to it, right? This is just open spectrum. Right. Equipment. The, the only equipment cost is the, is the equipment. Yeah. The equipment, exactly. And so yeah. while that There's may that. not yet be uh, eligible, uh, mm -hmm. there is no prohibition itself against the use of TV white space. It's the interpretation of how it's being used. And our right. position on this is that it is eligible under the ancillary use clause. Ancillary use, and as the E rate. Coordinator, uh, you can certainly correct me here, but we developed with a grant from the Knight Foundation a uh, year before last uh, a legal opinion with one of the leading E-rate law firms in D.C. saying that uh, if the use is considered ancillary, which means a very small amount of the bandwidth or the data at the library is being used, you know, in other ways, it's it can be considered uh, ancillary and, and therefore eligible which also says if it's too difficult to calculate what that is uh, mm. for one reason or another, then it's also ancillary. So which, that's which, which, which part is extending beyond, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's our position that it is eligible. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, hurt your eligibility, shall we say, uh, in your current E-rate uh, uh, applications to use this in that, uh, in that uh, circumstance. And our baseline for this is that even if the libraries don't have gig fiber today, they're designated for that. And as a fraction right. of a gigabit, uh, you know, uh, uh, a few tens of megabits, you know, 10 megabits is 1% of a gigabit. 100 megabits is only 10%, which we would consider small and ancillary. So these are really small amounts of, uh, of the bandwidth to allocate for this kind of ancillary use. And then also the remote locations, uh, we are encouraging libraries to think of as library properties. You know, it's a physical library service space. Now, I know there's a lot of, you know, this gets much more ambiguous about what that is, but a, a library kiosk would definitely be a library property, like a bookmobile would be a library property. How about a book oh, yeah. corner in the city hall? So these kinds of interpretations kind of get up at the, at the edge of what's possible, we think the ancillary interpretation is solid. Right, and actually Tom just made the comment as well that um, 
if the remote locations are eligible locations, like you said, a another branch of the library or the school or the bookmobile or some other location that you then say to Erate is this is one of our this is one of our places, then of course, yes. There you go. There you go. Good, yeah. good point. So there are yeah, ways yeah. So be ambitious about that. We've gotten encouragement on uh, from the FC all of our meetings to be more assertive in these interpretations. Now the sure, checkout hotspot yeah. is an ongoing is service like, fee, and I can appreciate that's a different thing. Right, right. Um, and you you had explained the difference in that earlier, yeah. And just like you said, you how you described with um, Manhattan, Kansas, the, getting the TV white space, and then that showed what the demand was for the fiber. Same thing with FCC and E rate is if we keep asking for it and they see that it's a demand, that's how they change. Every year, E rate eligible um, services are changed. They're reviewed every single year. And if they keep seeing applications or things saying, hey, we, we, we were looking for this, they will look at them and see, oh, wait, maybe we need to rethink and add that in. I mean, when E rate first started back in 97, 98, a lot of this, everything we have now didn't exist, obviously. That's so right. it's a it's a fluid thing. So you know, it doesn't hurt um, to put in things that you're not sure. And if they get enough, they'll something. You know, it'll set off notices and alarms somewhere. Well, we're saying that it doesn't require them to yeah. do any interpretations uh, at all. I mean, mm -hmm. there may be a challenge, and then it would become that. But we're saying today, yeah. it's it qualifies. Not the equipment yet, but. Right. But use of the spectrum certainly does yeah. in supporting this. So I know some libraries will be looking into, well, how do we pay that, however much it costs for the equipment and mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. They're always looking for ways, yeah. All right, so um, any other questions coming in? We're just at a little after 11 o'clock. Um, anybody have any last-minute questions you want to desperately uh, ask of uh, Kristen and Don before we um, wrap up for today? We do have a just comment saying thanks. Excellent webinar from Tom. <laughs> thanks, Tom. <laughs> um, I have been throughout the show grabbing any of the links that you have mentioned. The uh, the link to the video. I already had somebody ask about that video because it's a very good, concise, couple of minute introduction to how this all works that you can share with um, your community, your stakeholders, whoever that you want to um, you know pitch this to. Um, and the website and the class that the, uh, Kristen has going, um, all of that is, I've been um, adding the links to our delicious account here so you'll be able to um, have easy access to those afterwards with recording of the show. Uh, one point on, this, on, on raising money, I think this is uh, often a question. We had one project in southwest Colorado, small town, uh, they were running a trial project uh, and uh, they had set it up, a couple of remotes on Main Street in their, in their city park, which was supporting the market, which wasn't an expected use, it was really valued, but mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they had their budget cut just in the middle of the trial project, and, and so they didn't have money to buy the $6,000 system. So what they did was uh, start uh, use a Kickstarter to raise the, the, the money to buy oh. the equipment, they, and in 20 days they had raised the money and not only raised the money, but they had raised awareness in the community that the library was, you know, getting busy doing, you know, helping serve the community. Nice. And yeah. so it was a, you know, a great story. Uh, There's so many ways like that now so that you can ways. raise some exactly. funds on things right. like that. Yeah. So if you're determined, you'll you'll be able to find a way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. It does not look like anybody typed any other new questions to us, so I think we will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Kristen and Don. That was a really good explanation of this. I have to admit, when I've, I've heard about TV White Space here and there and um, hadn't spent enough time as I should have investigating what it is, but now I am definitely more on top of <laughs> how to promote it. To I knew it was like, it's a new way, way cheap, easy. Do it. But now I can actually talk about it if I wanted to myself. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I, I know what yeah. you mean. You know, people hear it and they go, "Oh no, not another entry into the alphabet soup of telecommunications." Uh, right. I do not want to hear about it. But yeah, you look at it a little bit; it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to pull back screen control to my monitor now. Here, there we go. And. There's my screen now. Um, as I said, here is the uh, Gigabit Library's website, um, and I have put into our delicious account, let's see if I can make sure I, I'm going to show it here, uh, links to this and 
the class, the video that you had up, um, there it is, there's a video link on YouTube. So all of these you'll be able to have access to afterwards when we put up the recording of today's show. Um, and the recording will go on here is our, this is the page for today's show, but this is our Encompass Live website, um, pretty easy, uh, nlc.nebraska.gov forward slash Encompass Live. You can also Google us, search us anywhere online. So far this is the only thing called Encompass Live, so <laughs> type that in, you'll find our show. Um, we have our upcoming shows listed here, but right here underneath I want to show you is where our archives come um, will be posted. This is uh, last week's show, Build a Better World. It was about our summer, the summer, upcoming summer reading program. We'll have a link to the recording, um, presentation slides, um, and this one is to a handout, but then down here links to all the websites. And Kristen, if you um, send me the slides or post them somewhere yourself, we can link to that for people. Oh, definitely, yeah, I'll definitely send this to you. Yeah. We have a slide share account that we use for that. Um, so when the recording is available, I'll let everybody know. Um, it should be sometime later this afternoon as long as YouTube cooperates and does things quickly. <laughs> um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is Conversation Circles, a simple ESL program. Um, this is about a, 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 new, a, a really interesting program that done at um, Los Alamos County Libraries in New Mexico. Um, English conversation circles, trying to get patrons who wanted to practice speaking, um, you know, live speaking English um, with other people. So um, Elizabeth Rivera from there, that library will be with us next week to talk about their program. See if that's something you might want to get started in your library. So please do sign up for that and any of our other upcoming shows. Um, I do have things scheduled for other, um, first date in April, I'm just waiting for confirmation on the description for that and May dates coming up so always keep an eye on our schedule or our, um, here on the calendar adding new topics all the time uh, also Encompass Live is on Facebook we do have a link here to our Facebook page which I've got over here so if you are um, a big Facebook user do give us a like we post um, updates to what's going on in the show right here this morning I posted a, a reminder to log in on the fly for people um, when our recordings are available I post them here there we go uh, reminders about the next show so um, there it is, recording from last week's. So if you are uh, using Facebook a lot, do um, like us over there and you can keep up with what's going on with the show. Um, otherwise, other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's Encompass Live. Thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you next time on the show. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Kristen and Don. You, uh, you go beyond the walls of Nebraska for sure. I heard about Me this too. from Bangladesh. Someone what? in Bangladesh told me about this. I mean, I, of course, I knew about it. <laughs> they heard about it. Okay, we do. We do have people for like, even today, as you saw with the with the in the intro slides, um, registered attendees from all over the country. Yeah, um, these kind of webinars do go out to anyone who wants to um, attend. We're free and open to anybody. Um, all sorts of varying topics. Uh, you have someone online just saying they're logged in from Kansas, so not as far as Bangladesh. But we have had some attendees from outside of the country um, and some presenters every now and then as well. Canada, um, Britain, so. Well, great job. This is uh, this is really well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right.